Well, today we are at week three of our February series, Weathering the Storm. We're halfway through our topics that we're offering as food for thought as to how we can navigate through some of the, the storms that arise in our lives. We spent our time two weeks ago looking at how we could jumpstart our practices of self-care when our usual methods just aren't working for us anymore. Last week, we dove into the power of love and we took a look at the many ways in which it can bring healing into, into our hearts and our lives, as well as to the hearts and lives of others and even to our greater world at large. And today we're gonna to spend our time looking at a process and also just a spiritual practice of letting go of concerns in the midst of change. So I thought I'd begin by sharing a few comments from author Tama Keeves. Uh, I receive her monthly newsletter and I had kept one from last June in my lesson planning files and, and I found it to speak to our message for today. Uh, her words feel as if she is she's recognizing this process of change and uncertainty that we can all experience at one time or another, while at the same time offering like a cheer on, on, on our behalf. So the article that she, uh, she wrote, she titled, How to Trust and Love a Life of Instability. And she wrote in part, how do you love your life when you feel out of control? Well, rest assured, when things fall apart, something else is falling together. Your circumstances are not a mistake, an accident, or a devastation. It's part of co-creation. This life is alive and you are where you need to be. It's not as though your, your wise, eternal inner self fell asleep at the wheel. You're still plugged in to power and flow. But the experience before you doesn't look like your idea of bliss. You are against this circumstance, this life, and everything coming down the pike forevermore. Well, here's the secret to life, if you will. Every situation in your life has magic up its sleeve. Find a way to show up with love for yourself and to treat this time in your life as sacred. Do not be fooled by events. The truth is always present. Everything is moving you closer to your true desires. So feel what you need to feel, then decide to show up with an open mind and heart. Because when you show up, life reveals itself to you. There is always a gift that is being offered. This is a practice for the rest of your life. This is your life. Dare to meet all of it with love. When things are falling apart, something else is falling together. Those words were the ones that, that really hooked me, that resonated with me uh, a lot. And I realized how easy it is for me, and maybe for you, to feel or even know when things or something is falling apart and how difficult it can be for me, maybe for you to feel or know what it is that is falling together. And so I asked myself, you know, where could I look for some sort of master class, you know, on how to be okay with both parts of that sometimes inseparable equation? You know, how could I learn more about letting go of worry and embracing that unknown? How could I learn more about being at peace in the midst of change? Well, I didn't have to look very far because sitting right on top of everything else in my lesson planning files was Unity's Lenten booklet for this year. I don't know if you can make it out from where you are, but it's titled Release and Renew, a Spiritual Practice for Lent 2021. And within this booklet are daily readings for the season of Lent that we are now in. But what really fed my soul and, and answered those questions I just asked was a perspective on the Lenten journey that I had not ever seen before. You may be familiar with the phrase, Jesus's last seven words. 
They're compiled from readings found in the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John. Uh, many, many Good Friday services focus on them. Um, I've offered my thoughts on them several times as I've participated with local colleagues and offering the, the annual Good Friday service sponsored by Central United Methodist Church downtown. Well, in our booklet for this year, each of the readings for the seven Sundays of Lent present one of seven living words. They reference the very same verses of scripture, but they focus on life and not death. They're taken from a book that's titled The Seven Living Words, and it's a book that was written by Reverend Mark Anthony Lord. Um, he is uh, the minister at Unity in Naples, Florida. And so what better master teacher could I find than Jesus? And what greater change could there be than all that he went through in his, his final weeks and days and even his final hours in this life? And so we're going to take a look at these seven words that Reverend Mark discerned as he offered his thoughts about the practice of releasing in the midst of change in order to renew and transform our lives. And so the first living word is forgiveness. And the scripture verse of its origin comes from Luke. It's in the 23rd chapter, the 34th verse, and it reads, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, first, I wondered how forgiveness played a role in our letting go of concerns in the midst of change. But then I thought about how you know, sometimes we can blame others or we can blame ourselves for whatever, for whatever is, is up for us at that particular time. And the per perspective of, on forgiveness that Reverend Mark offered is one that goes beyond our usual thoughts about just human forgiveness that we offer to one another, because he saw this forgiveness as being something that is offered from a higher state of being, you know, forgiveness that's offered from the spiritual aspect of ourselves. And he notes that it is this higher state of consciousness that recognizes and affirms that there is only good, that under the murky illusion of duality, only good really exists. And so what's the duality? What's well, when we're in the midst of an uncomfortable change and the midst of un, uh, uncertainty and doubt and, and so forth, that, that we experience it as someone or something that's against us, that's out to get us for whatever reason. It's when we see ourselves as deserving this outer punishment, if you will, for some reason. It's when we've gone to those places of fear and anxiety and stress that take our awareness away from our oneness with God. But Mark gives us a powerful reminder for if or when that happens. He writes, no matter what, no matter what you or I do in our fear, it does not and will not take us or anyone out of the heart and love of God. So instead of fear, we trust what our master for today taught. We call upon this forgiveness and we just allow it to dissolve away any fear or sense of separation from spirit that may have crept into our minds. We allow it to begin or perhaps continue the process of, of transformation that wants to take place in us in this time of change. The second living word is now. The scripture verse that supports it comes from Luke chapter 23, verse 43. And it reads, today you will be with me in paradise. Now you recall that those words are, are attributed to, to Jesus speaking to the two men who were hanged on crosses on either side of him. And taken literally, we would you know, basically say that what he was telling them is that you know, they were going to go, they would be in heaven after they died. Well, here's the metaphysics that spoke to Reverend Mark. What if we see Jesus as being representative of now? And we see each of the two men on either side of him representing one representing our past and one representing the future. So right now, you or I may be in the midst of a challenge. We might be in the midst of a, a personal crisis of some kind, one, that, one of profound transformation that's trying to take place. And very often when that happens, our past and our future take up a very big part of the picture 
that we're seeing. Because there we, we are, you know, we're just trucking along, you know, with how we feel life is quote unquote supposed to be. And it's a supposed to be that's been created based on our past experiences and our future expectations. But then in a seeming heartbeat, all that just implodes. And what we're seeing now is a time of, of darkness and, and uncertainty and paradise seems pretty far away and perhaps not even attainable. However, that word paradise is used many times in scripture interchangeably with the phrase kingdom of heaven. And what did Jesus teach about the kingdom of heaven? He said that it is at hand. It is right here, right now. Always was, always will be. The key point of it is that it can only be experienced in the present moment. So we do our best to not allow our concerns based on fears, based on what has occurred in the past, or what we're concerned about in the future. We don't allow that to take away the peace that can also only be experienced in the now moment. So this brings us to living word number three, which is oneness. And for scripture, we go to the book of John, chapter 19, verses 26 and 27, which reads, behold your son, behold your mother. And these are words spoken again by Jesus to his mother, Mary, and to his disciple, John. And again, everything that Jesus did was teaching. And this is another form of spiritual direction being given by him. And it lays forth for his mother and for his disciple the, the, the relationship they share in oneness with each other. And so he's encouraging them as well as still today encouraging us to look higher than just our human selves and only our human realities to see ourselves as spirit sees us. And, and we are so much in need of more of this today. I know I need more of it as I look at my own life. And I think a whole lot of us all over the place need a lot, lot more of it as we look at others. We need more of it so that we or any, anybody else can just stop seeing people as our enemies or even just you know, people that we hesitate to even get to know because they look or think or believe differently than us. We need it so that people can stop wishing other people to fail so that they can stop bringing harm to others or grow out of their way just to be impediments to their continued forward, upward movement and growth. You know, this takes us back to those ideas of, of, of duality. And yet in the midst of all this chaos, all this stuff that goes on, you know, all around us, we have never stopped being that wholeness of spirit that is each of us. We just cannot pick that up and set it aside. It is what it is, and it always patiently waits until we decide to turn our gaze away from all of that and back to it and its presence in us. Reverend Mark writes, in my God self, it is safe to see all as one. And not only is it safe, it is true, and it is wonderful. What gets crucified is the illusion of separation, fear, and suffering. The only way this collective lie of separation will ever be transformed is through you and me, one person at a time. That's what Jesus brilliantly showed us. He refused to buy into or support any world system where the fuel of fear and separation generated power. He knew oneness. He only saw oneness, and he taught there is only one life here of which we are all a part. The fourth of our living words is truth. So this time we venture into both Matthew and Mark's gospel, specifically Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, and Mark chapter 15, verse 34, and they offer, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, many might read those words and really wonder if Jesus, if it was possible 
for Jesus to feel you know, abandoned and forgotten, ignored, forsaken. You know, many will, will see him, think of him, and, and just, just affirm that he was enlightened for his entire life. But again, let's look at Jesus the teacher, as he was always doing you know, in his ministry. And we're at living word number four. We're right in the middle of the seven words that we're looking at in total. And if we look at, look at this across our, our Lenten journey, we're, we'd be right in the middle of Lent and the transformation that we're talking about today. And there's a saying that says that it's always darkest before the dawn, right? And applying that to the scriptural verse, as it applies to whatever we may be going through, tells us that, that we're getting close. We're getting close to what we seek. It tells us that we've been doing the work, taking to heart the teachings and the modelings offered to us from centuries ago. And it tells us that you and I, yes, we may have hit a wall in this, in this middle point, but there is a much more deeply rooted truth in us at this point. It's the one that says, okay, just take one more deep breath in and then one big exhale out. And let that exhale be the one that just clears away anything that may still be in our thoughts, in our hearts, that would hold us back in, in any way from what we have been called to become. It's telling us just take that one more breath because you are ready. If we could only hold on to those words of possibility and assurance in the darkest of times, because doing so is a huge step in knowing. It's a huge statement of knowing that we have been doing exactly what is necessary for us to grow, exactly what is necessary for us to gain new insights, exactly what is necessary for us to change and to change for the better. So it's important to stay that course work with whatever fears present themselves and continue breathing into that truth of spirit and the fact that it has not, could not, would never abandon, betray, forget, ignore, or forsake us. So now we're at the place of the fifth living word and it's vision. Just two words for this one comes from John chapter 19, verse 28, I thirst, I thirst. Now, Reverend Mark, in his writing, interprets these words as spoken by Jesus as having absolutely nothing to do with dehydration or any other physical need of his body. Looking at them through the lens of Jesus' spiritual teachings, he sees them as Jesus speaking to a desire that gives your soul eternal life. In other words, a thirst for the life of God that is within us all. So, so you could look at it this way, perhaps, and consider times when, when you have been you know, in the zone, as we, as we say. You may have been doing some writing or painting. You may have been um, creating a, a vision board or a collage of goals. You may have been out on the trails, cross-country skiing. You may have been playing some kind of sport. And in the process of doing so, you were so in the zone that you lost all track of time. Your book or your journal, page after page has been filled without you lifting up a pen for hours. Or your, your canvas or your cork board, it has come alive with color and flair and all things you. Or you have you know, traversed a longer distance than you ever had, or you've scored in your sport more easily than ever before. And you didn't realize that any of that was happening until it stopped and you were able to see and realize all that you had done. Well, that realization is also an awakening. And it's an awakening to a clear vision that when you partner with, when you thirst for, the most powerful creative source within you. There is nothing more than you need, more that you need. There is nothing that you cannot move through and beyond. There is nothing that you cannot do. So we're almost there. We're at living word number six. And it tells us that we're almost there because living word number six is completion. And this time, not just two words. Now we get three words also from John 
chapter 19, verse 30. And the three words are, it is finished. It is finished. Now, Reverend Mark refers to this stage as the one that we call what is done, done. And it is done at every level of our, of our being, every single level of our being. Whatever we've been putting on that cross, whatever we've been working to cross out of our lives, all of it in every way, shape, and form has reached its point of completion. And so how would we know this? Well, for one, we have the clarity that we were seeking. We have answers to the questions we put out to the universe. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the prayers we have been affirming have manifested. Everything that was once in front of us and standing in our way is gone. Have you ever stood still in your tracks anyway? I mean, have you ever seen nothing but clear roads in front of you and somehow have that trigger you in ways that cause you to remain right where you are? You know, why is it that sometimes we cannot just easily free ourselves and move forward in confidence? Reverend Mark offered a, a bit of a visual example to try to, to, to explain this. He likened it to ha our, our having planted, you know, the most beautiful garden, right? You know, we, we've cleared the space, we've cut away any of the overgrowth, you know, we've uh, pulled out you know, all of the weeds and so forth, and we've planted, you know, what we wanted to plant. And this garden comes into full, full bloom and beauty, and we step back and we call it good. And then about a month later, we go out to enjoy more of our good. And what do we see? Well, new weeds, small little weeds starting to make their way out of the soil. And we have a choice. We can stand there and just keep looking at it and glaring at it. Or we could just go and clear away a couple new weeds that showed up, which will in, that, in fact make room for even more growth. What did Tam McKeith say? This is a practice for the rest of your life. So with all that we've gleaned and learned and practiced from the first five living words, we're now invited to claim that completion even more boldly than before, to continue claiming the good that is ours and take steps forward in the fulfillment of a new way of life and a new way of living that we seek. Let the day you had planned dissolve into the day, into the day that was planned. Those words are paraphrased from Tiana Keeves. And she wrote them as she shared a story about a day that she had planned out in the greatest detail. It's going to be the best day ever. And it was going to go one way that changed, changed dramatically and turned into one that she referred to as a tide of occurring events that was turned out to be so much better. But she did, she found that that better way, experienced the better that wanted to come forth because she lived our last living word. She chose to surrender, surrender. For Jesus, he spoke it in the words of Luke chapter 26, verse four, I'm sorry, chapter 23, verse 46, when he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Reverend Mark wrote that that moment right there, that was his resurrection. It was the moment that his journey of transformation was over. It was his complete return to spirit. You know, for us, our enlightenment may take a little bit more time. And that's why we're called to a practice of living these seven words over and over and over again. But we can do so knowing that always deeper layers of life are always available for us to discover. We just have to be willing to accept the change in us and the sometimes on chaos that accompanies it. We have to accept whatever that brings, knowing that we're on the right path. I believe that surrender, this last living word, is the most powerful one in any process of transformation. 
Reverend Mark called the relief that it can bring phenomenal and that it's the greatest spiritual practice that we can employ. Because he said, all we're seeking to it, all we're seeking is to know God in and as our life. All our spirit truly wants is the experience of the kingdom of heaven. And so may all of you be guided by these living words of Lent. And may you dare to meet all that they bring with love. God bless you.